Uh, turn in your Bibles there. We're going to, again, a rather long passage, and it's not uh, uh, ideal to have a long passage for a teacher, at least, and also for you uh, uh, to, to try to teach it, but it is a one unit again, and it'll be uh, verses 21 through 40 of Luke chapter 2. And when we come to this 21st verse of Luke's second chapter, the seminal event of the birth of Jesus is still fresh on our minds. Uh, God became man. Uh, the world might not know it yet, but the world would never be the same. God visited our planet in the person of his son. Uh, but after only eight days, certain events are now described by Luke that uh, begin to reveal details of what the Christ child's future uh, will uh, entail. He gives us an understated account of the obedience of his parents. And then suddenly the, the providential witness of two devout servants of God who happen on the scene and whose testimony both reveals details of the child's destiny and really bolsters the confidence and, and faith of Mary and Joseph. In the passage before us, obedience and providence meet uh, to prepare us for the steady and singular uh, growth of Jesus into the man he would become. So let's read the passage, uh, chapter two, verse 21, when eight days had passed, before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That's out of Exodus chapter 12. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, I'm not going to say a lot about Anna in the lesson, but she was from Asher. Uh, one of the lost, so-called lost tribes, but this is evidence that uh, some at the time were still tracing their heritage from uh, the individual tribes. And so she was advanced in years, verse 36. She was older. And she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, there's different ways to translate that. It could be that she lived to the age of 84. It could be that she lived 84 years after her marriage. So she could have been a very old woman uh, into her hundreds. 
verse 37, she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. We have people like that in, in our church. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Israel. If you look back up to verse 26, Simeon, had, it had been revealed to him that he would see the Lord's Christ, and Anna is looking for the same thing, the redemption of, of, Israel, of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. I think it might be uh, helpful at the beginning if I explain a little more clearly the, the title and outline of constructed for this morning's lesson. There are two primary advances to the story that Luke is seeking to present. One is the presentation of the baby Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem. The other is the reaffirmation announced by Simeon and then by Anna that this child is indeed the promised savior. Now I say reaffirmation because Mary and Joseph had already been told uh, who the child was uh, from no less than an angel of God and then by Zacharias and uh, Elizabeth and even by the shepherds overcome by the glory of the heavenly hosts. So the title I've chosen is this, Jesus Presented, Salvation Announced. They two go together, and they are the two primary movements in the passage. But there, I want you to note that there is a conflation of activities described in the opening verses, verses 21 through 24, and summarized in verse 39. That will need some expanding upon, but each of them have one thing in common. They are undertaken as individual acts of obedience to God. So I've summarized them in the outline under the broad heading of obedience. And obedience, as you know, will prove to be a most essential attribute of the newborn child and not surprisingly also of his parents. Jesus Christ was born under the law, as Paul would later write in Galatians 4, born of a woman born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Christ would fulfill the law perfectly. And in consequence, he would qualify to be our savior. And we would gain entry into the family of God. It's a wonderful thing. It seems almost mundane here, this description, but it's not. The second and third movements in this section are, are easier to see. First, the, the providential intersection of Simeon and Anna with the arrival of Jesus at the temple, bearing witness to his appointed task. And lastly, the kind of typical progress report. report. If you're a student of Luke, you know this. Uh, he was accustomed to provide these progress reports uh, intermittently throughout his gospel and in the book of Acts as well. That's verse 40. Well, eight days had passed since Jesus was born. God had ordained through Abraham centuries before that all who would be a part of the promises given to Abraham would be circumcised, at least every male would be circumcised on the eighth day. And this is recorded, as you know, in Genesis chapter 17. And so Luke describes how his parents had Jesus circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Now, they would not have failed to obey that ordinance. But the more important thing, and Luke's emphasis, is on the naming of the child. They named him Jesus. 
uh, the name given by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. And in this too, they obeyed the Lord. Uh, the name meant uh, Yahweh is Savior or Yahweh saves. It is the, the finest name. It is the sweetest a name to those of us who have received a saving grace and experienced the assurance that God sent in his son into our world to save sinners like all of us in this room this morning. And it could only have been a defining moment in the lives of Mary and Joseph to give him that name. Uh, both had been, you remember this too, both had been commanded separately to give him that name, to name the child Jesus. And nine months of anticipation followed and now they could finally fulfill God's will for them. Salvation had come in the person of this little baby. But now in verse 22, Luke takes a step back, if I can put it that way. Uh, to paint the broader picture of Mary and Joseph's scrupulous adherence to the law's obligations. Uh, you have to read these verses carefully, uh, for you will see that he describes in parallel fashion two separate ceremonial observances, the, the purification of the mother of a newborn child and the presentation or the offering of a firstborn son to the Lord. I said that Luke uh, conflated the two, but if you read carefully, you can see how he distinguishes them. In verse 22, look there, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And then picking it back up in verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That second clause is a reference to the purification ceremony. Uh, but let's start, with, let's start with the presentation of Jesus. To truly understand this, ideally, we go back to the Exodus. We go, we'll go back all the way to the Exodus from Egypt and the night of the Passover when God slew uh, every firstborn male in the kingdom of Egypt, uh, but he protected uh, the faithful of Israel, whom he rescued from the destroyer. And flowing out of that, and, and because of that event, God laid claim to the firstborn male of every Israelite family to be in his service. So he may claim to every firstborn male. Uh, but you know, most of you, that in grace, the Lord substituted one tribe, the, the tribe of Levi, to stand for all the firstborn of all the other tribes. And yet he still, so instead of taking every individual firstborn son and dedicating him completely to serving the Lord. He took a tribe. He took the tribe of Levi. And yet he still required a payment to be made whenever a firstborn son was born in a family. And we glance up to verse 7. Please look up there to remember that Luke has advised us that Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, and she laid him in, and she wrapped him in cloths, and she laid him in, in a manger, and you can read all about this practice in Exodus chapter 13 and the third chapter of Numbers and other places. Uh, Luke quotes from Exodus 13, as I said in the reading in his 23rd verse. So that's one thing Joseph and Mary were doing, except here it gets quite interesting because Luke makes no mention of uh, the five shekel price paid for the redemption of their firstborn. Why not? Uh, why does he not mention this redemption price paid by Mary and Joseph? Well, there's precedent for that. If you think back to the first chapter of First Samuel and the account of the birth of Samuel, uh, Hannah was barren, 
And she had prayed fervently for a child and had even vowed that if God uh, gave her a son, a, a firstborn son, she would give him to the Lord to serve him all the days of his life. In other words, her son would not be redeemed with money, but actually be devoted to the Lord for his life. And so the miracle child Samuel was. Uh, as soon as he was weaned, uh, he went and lived with the priest Eli, and, and he served there for the rest of his life in Shiloh. Now, this is almost certainly what Luke des describes here. Uh, Joseph and Mary presented Jesus as their firstborn son at the temple, but they offered no redemption price. Instead, they consecrated the child to the Lord's service. He belonged to the Lord in a way that was different uh, than for them. And, and Jesus was to serve the Lord with a consecrated life, not to be compared with any. The second ceremony the couple observed was also required according to Jewish law, when a woman gave birth to a child, she became ceremonially unclean. In the case of a birth of a son, according to Leviticus 12, verse 4, she would remain in that condition for 33 days after this boy was circumcised. And then when the days of her purification were completed, the language that Luke uses, and now according to Leviticus 12, verse 6, when those days were completed, she was to bring to the priest at the tent of meeting uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Mary Joseph's case, the temple in Jerusalem, a year old lamb for a burnt offering. And if the offerer could not afford a lamb, she could substitute two doves or uh, two young pigeons. And that's what Luke references in verse 24. Joseph and Mary had come to Jerusalem to, quote, to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Pigeons. So Luke makes special note of this, perhaps to remind the reader of the humble circumstances under which the eternal Son of God entered into our world. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Now, reading these few verses, it, it might seem rather innocuous what the young couple and their child were engaged in, yet it was uh, all an expression of their devotion to God, their devotion to the Lord, and their desire to comply with every holy requirement of the law of God. Jesus had come into this world to save the world, and these few verses reveal that at this young age, he was the lamb without blemish. Well, while Mary and Joseph were in the temple, they were met by two other faithful Israelites whose lives were characterized by devotion to God and to the messianic hope, Simeon and Anna. Luke's account uh, reads as uh, within, you know, it, just, it just so happened kind of tone, reminding us of the reality of God's supernatural orchestration of the events of our lives and how his providence uh, works to advance his will. It just so happened that while Joseph and Mary and the Christ child were in the temple, Simeon and then Anna happened by. We actually know very little about either of them. They, they both appear to have been aged. Uh, Anna, for sure, for Luke, suggests to us her advanced age. And, and Simeon seems to have been at that stage of life in which he was anticipating death. Simeon is described as a man who was righteous and devout, meaning that 
in his behavior with others. He was kind, he was giving, and, and likewise in his life uh, before God, he was conscientious, he was devoted. We know people like that. People like Simeon uh, take serious what they know God desires of them. Uh, they make it the major priority of their life to heed his will for them and, and, and be active in his service. They're righteous and devout. As I thought about Simeon this week and, and Anna too, whom Luke describes in verse 37 as never leaving the temple but serving night and day with fastings and prayers, uh, the thought came to me, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. I want to be the kind of person, uh, the, the kind of servant of the Lord that Simeon and Anna were. In case you're wondering, I'm not, but I want to be. And I'm sure you've often felt and, and thought the same way, but we all meet with resistance to that. Uh, resistance from within ourselves, rising up from uh, the allurements of the world and our own self-seeking that intrudes on such an aspiration. But per perhaps age is an antidote to that. I'm counting on that. For Luke goes on to describe Simeon as looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the consolation of of Israel. That is, Simeon was filled with expectancy for the coming Messiah. Now, we, we made the point in a previous lesson that this was a dark period in Israel's history. They, they lived under the harsh rule of uh, the Roman Empire and especially the cruel king uh, uh, Herod. Uh, and their own leadership, the Jewish leadership, was corrupt and abusive of the people they were supposed to be shepherding. They were haunted by the questions so often raised at times such as this, when God seems nowhere to be found, where is he? Where is God in our travail? Where is God in our disappointment? Where is God in our prayers that aren't answered the way we want them uh, to be prayered? Uh, four centuries had passed since God had sent a prophecy to his people. Yet Simeon had not lost hope. He found comfort in God's inviolable promises, and his promise to send Messiah was his consolation, his comfort. He must have lived and breathed, Isaiah 40. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. So he entered the temple hungry for even greater confirmation of the hope that he already had. And in that, I'd like to suggest Simeon serves as a model for us. Uh, when we come together, as we do, as we are this morning, to hear the word of God and, and to fellowship with one another in the way that, that, that we do, we, we can be eager uh, to anticipate that the Lord will confirm in our hearts uh, the hope he has planted there through his spirit. It reminds me of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and he's gathered up all his friends and family, and God has arranged this whole thing for Peter to come, and he comes in, I think it's in our bulletin, we're all gathered here to hear all that God has commanded you to say. And that, that's the attitude I want uh, for me, and I know you want it for you. When we get in our cars, come to church on Sunday, or whatever the case may be, uh, last Sunday, watching the live stream, watching it spin, <laughs> finally giving up. Um, but when we come with expectant, Hearts. That was Simeon. And the fact that the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon gave him the confidence he needed to listen to God speak to him through his spirit and, and understand that indeed the coming of Messiah was imminent. Simeon would not see death 
the Spirit had told him before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And the fact that he came in the Spirit into the temple, as verse 27 informs us, is the great indicator that this was no random meeting, but the Spirit guided him there so that he was in the path of the parents of Jesus when they brought him in. And now we see what, what Simeon did when he met them. He took the infant child in his arms. He knew what he was doing. Uh, he knew who the child was as his blessing that follows makes clear. We can't know what Simeon actually expected to see. Perhaps from prophecy, he anticipated his Messiah would be a little baby uh, carried lovingly by his mother. I mentioned in our last lesson that Christmas hymn, I like the hymn, uh, who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could hold God in our hands? And yet here Simeon was holding the Son of God in, in his arms. Now, the fact of the incarnation requires us to understand that, physically at least, uh, the baby Jesus was an ordinary infant. Uh, there was nothing spectacular in his appearance, no halo aloft over his head, uh, only the tiny, uh, weak, perhaps crying child, month and a half old baby. And this scene reflects the sober truth of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, that he who existed in the form of God did not regard that thing of equality with God as something to be held on to for dear life. Don't anyone take it away from me. Uh, rather, he emptied himself by taking on the form of this fragile little child, helpless and dependent on others and of course going on to endure all and more of the humiliation that is the experience of every man and woman born in the flesh but Simeon knew the child was no ordinary baby he held in his arms not just a baby but salvation itself and the wondrous uh, thought moved him to to burst into praise to God. And that's what the Nunc Dimittis, which follows, is a, a hymn of worship to God for the salvation he was accomplishing through the Christ Simeon held in his arms. And because of it, Simeon was ready to die in peace. Like Mary's Magnificat and, and Zacharias's Benedictus before, Simeon's song of prophecy acquired the identifying title Nunc Dimittis by virtue of the opening word or words of the Latin translation. It's, it's the product really of the church's regard for its content. Nunc Dimittis translates, now you are releasing or now you are allowing to uh, depart. The meaning is that now God is allowing Simeon to leave this earth and die. Now was the time at last, the time that had been in the mind of our triune God from eternity past, but that had now reached its fullness in created time and space. Now the era of salvation had arrived because the Messiah had come. And Simeon himself explains in verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. Where is God's salvation? It's in Simeon's arms. Salvation is the person he held even then in his own grasp. To have Jesus is to have salvation. Nothing else is required. Jesus is God's mighty horn of salvation. And he is for everybody. Uh, the salvation Jesus brings is universal salvation. Uh, Simeon sings God's praises. God, God prepared, prepared his salvation 
in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the, the glory of your people, Israel. The Lord had historically uh, performed a special work with his chosen people. Uh, they serve as a, as a great object lesson to the world that God's grace is a distinguishing grace. Uh, Jesus came, he said, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and the apostles uh, echoed that. But his purpose always incorporated Gentiles' salvation. Salvation came through the Jews, but it was also the only avenue for all peoples to be saved. And there's still a future for ethnic uh, Israel. But Simeon quotes, notice, from Isaiah chapter 9 to express the breadth and magnitude of the salvation he held in his arms. For the Gentiles, that salvation is likened to the light of revelation, light that illuminates. They would come to know God and have a relationship with him through the light of the Christ child held in Simeon's arms. For Israel, he was their glory. It was upon Israel that God had in history past shown his Shekinah glory. They were privileged in that way. So in Simeon's words, we hear the echo of John 3.16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Well, Luke tells us in verse 33 that Jesus' father and mother were amazed at the things that were being said about him. Of course, Joseph was not Jesus' real father, but he was acting as his father, and that speaks well of him. Consequently, uh, the child would uh, have the opportunity to publicly honor his father and his mother and, and thus again fulfill the law. And that they were amazed, how could be they be more amazed than they already were, uh, means that the destiny of their child would continue to amaze them. Though they'd already heard wondrous things from an angel no less, Simeon's Testimony expanded on it to include the whole world. So Simeon blessed them in verse 34, but then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he spoke directly to Mary in verse uh, 34 now. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed, then a parenthetical thought, and a sword will pierce even your own soul, and then finishing his thought to the end that through that, <laughs> I'm having trouble reading, uh, somebody finish the verse for me, thoughts from many hearts may be revealed, you got to get that fixed. So his address to Mary is in two parts. Uh, the first is a prophecy of the effect Christ would have on all peoples, but especially Israel. And the second concerns Mary alone. But first, he prophesies of the general consequences of the Christ entering into the world. He will cause a falling and he will cause a rising. There are two ways uh, to interpret that. One is to interpret it as one group, both falling and rising, and the meaning would be that uh, before one could come to Christ, one would need to figuratively fall or acknowledge one's poverty of spirit with the result that Christ would lift such a person up. He would w rise with Christ. That's a biblical view, right? We've taught it. The other interpretation is that the falling and rising refers to two different groups. One would fall to doom and the other would rise to salvation. And this view conforms with the scriptural 
image of Christ as the stone of stumbling uh, prophesied by Isaiah and applied by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 and also alternatively with Christ as the cornerstone uh, also borrowed uh, by Peter. Uh, both interpretations reflect truth and it's not necessary to settle on one over the other, though I believe the second is probably what Simeon by the Spirit was saying. Uh, Christ would prove to be the one upon whom the world's inhabitants would either stumble over and perish, that is, be a, a sign to be opposed, or else by faith others would make him one's foundation for life and, and live forever in his presence. Well, the broader consequence of Christ's coming is expressed in verse 35, uh, to the end that thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There could be no neutrality as concerns the Christ child. His coming meant judgment. He would prove to be the great divider of peoples. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. But we need to quickly, very quickly note that Simeon's prophecy also contains this parenthetical commentary on the effect Christ's coming would ultimately have on Mary. And it's nestled there in verse 34. A sword will pierce even your own soul. And it's quite obviously a, a warning that Mary will in the future suffer greatly as she sees her own son, the son of God, suffer and die on a cross. So poor Anna, I'm afraid, will not receive the attention she deserves uh, today. A little is actually revealed about her. What is revealed, we've read. She was another providential witness that day in the temple to the newly born Redeemer. And the new family then returned to Galilee. Luke concludes, uh, having performed everything according to the law of the Lord, and the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And we're going to have opportunity in the verses and chapters ahead to see that. But I want to conclude uh, very quickly with three, I think, critical observations. First, uh, from the day of his birth, Jesus Christ fulfilled every requirement of the Mosaic law. He did not fail in any respect, and he always did what was pleasing to his heavenly Father, and that means that we have a holy Savior who was qualified to be our substitute as the unblemished Lamb of God. Secondly, the Lord uses devout people. He does. He uses devout people. Uh, he used godly Mary and Joseph and, and the righteous and devout Simeon and the faithful Anna. And he is using you and me when we are faithful to him and have as our greatest passion the desire to serve him and know him. And then finally, third, uh, here is the path to Nuc Dimittis. Uh, here is how God allows us to die in peace. It's because you have discovered, uh, embraced, and made a vital component of your life the reality of peace with God through the Prince of Peace. It will be through him alone that we depart this life in peace. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we have uh, the hope of peace. We have peace currently uh, because of this uh, person, the Son of God, who came into the world and humbled himself by taking on a human nature, became real flesh, took on a body, and died for us. May that be our hope uh, of each person in this room today. In Christ's name, amen.